Uh, so it sounds good. So a dyno, do you know about a dyno? What it does? No. So it stands for like a dynamographer, dynography. It's a power measurement tool. So okay. <clears throat> a rear wheel drive vehicle. So power is being sent to the rear wheels. So they hook up like a rolling uh, resistance measure on the rear wheels. And you'll see it here like, uh, yeah, like here. So what they do, so there's a roller in the back. So the car's not moving, but what they're able to simulate is what the engine's gonna be doing at higher speeds. And ultimately, what type of power um, can it produce at peak performance? Mm -hmm. Other things, probably also more just as important, is the general drivability. Because you can have like a crazy amount of horsepower or whatever, but if it's not like if you can't start it and you can't like just go around daily traffic, that sucks. Yeah, right. But being able to like basically drive it around on this roller without actually going on the street and like you know having traffic laws being broken, that's yeah. what it allows you to do. So. Pretty cool. <laughs> then you get measurements and it tells you graphs. And you can look at and tuners, a tuner is someone who can like modify it. You change the fuel mapping level, the timings of the motor, uh, change the change so many different things to get more power or take away less or to smooth out this graph. So the power mm -hmm. delivery is like nice and strong. Gotcha. Uh, this part right here, it says only 17 PSI. That's referring to how much boost the car is uh, producing. So this is a turbocharged vehicle which is indicated by this gigantic turbo here. Uh, so a measurement of how much airflow is going into the motor. It's actually wrong to use boost pressure, uh, but they use it to, as like a means, as a, as a measurement tool. And if you have more pressure inside the system, you can allow more air to flow through. But the proper thing to say should be like how much airflow is being. Which then equates to what? Uh, Engines on the whole, from a scientific perspective, they're basically the giant vacuum. Okay. They want oxygen. Oxygen is a required element for the combustion process. You need oxygen to make fire. How an engine works is there's a tiny explosion inside that engine. So a fire happens inside. What well, you need for fire, you need oxygen. So how much oxygen can you get into the engine is the determining factor of how much power you can get out of it. Mm, okay. So all of these things, like a turbocharger, all it's doing is it's allowed, it's forcing by like a spinning blade, more air into the engine. Okay, giving it more oxygen, equating to more power. Yeah. Now you can- That's what a blower is essentially then. Yeah. You can't just have pure air go into it. You have to increase the mixture of fuel. So the air to fuel ratio is required to have the proper combustion cycle. Generally, they say mm -hmm. the term they use is stoic, but like the perfect mixture is a 14.7 to one, meaning you have 14.7 air molecules for one fuel molecule. If you get that ratio, then you're going to have the perfect scientifically at least like combustion cycle. Uh, but obviously, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen. And many factors change. For example, atmosphere, like where in the world are you? Sea level has a huge determining factor. Uh, the lower sea level you are, there's more pressure the lower you go. Yep. So there's more, as they say, it's more, uh, well, I was blank the term, but there's more oxygen per cubic uh, centimeter at lower sea level than higher sea level. Right, right. Yeah, more pressure. Yeah. So Condensing it. Together. Um, so sometimes, like if, say, like this is probably California, but like say you did a dyno test like here in Vegas, or we're not in Vegas, but <laughs> if you were in Vegas, <clears throat> yeah, um, Vegas is about 2,000 feet above sea level. So when you do a dyno graph here, you can actually do corrective measures like, oh, if you were in California or if you were in sea level, this is how much power you would make. Because you typically would lose, like on this guy, we saw a, a number here like 850 or something. Yeah. If, if he had hit 850 in Vegas, he went to California, he might be like 880 or 900. Even more. Yeah. Because there's less air pressure? Because there's... Wait, so why would less air pressure equate to... No, or do you mean more? In California. There's more of air pressure. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. 
but that's just the basic there's so many more things you can go into as far as like engines and how they tune and how you get power out of them but just trying to give a very high level overview <laughs> yeah no that's pretty sweet that is cool uh, but basically this dude got 13.7 million views on his video for his car that he's working with which is cool yeah that's awesome yeah so do you have to tune your car i did myself yeah how do you do that i have a computer i have a aftermarket computer in the car to allow me to make changes for the fuel and for the timing of the vehicle so you're what are you influencing when you're changing those values in the computer you're influencing like the engine itself yes so ultimately i'm influencing the combustion cycle so in my car i have a rotary engine now, a rotary engine is actually very different than like a traditional internal combustion motor. But here's the basic gist I pulled up real quick. So there's a triangle, like this blue thing, spinning inside of a chamber, which is this yellow thing. So what happens is air, and there's four cycles to a combustion in, in a, on an internal combustion motor. Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. So the first cycle is in, intake right here. So basically air and fuel comes into uh, this chamber. So I follow this like around it, like for one chamber, it's like going all through things. Air and fuel comes in, then it gets compressed. By com since fluid is a non-compressible, it's generally not compressible. Um, the only thing that's gonna happen when you start compressing is the pressure of the air gets much greater. As pressure, air pressure increases, the amount of energy it takes to create a spark gets lower, which is why if you have higher compression, it's easier to create a spark or cause mm -hmm. a fire. Yeah. Take the air and fuel, they smush it, and then the spark plug fires. The spark plug is there just to find an electric jolt and cause the fire to happen. So the air and fuel comes in, gets compressed, gets sparked, and then boom, explosion. Explosion happens and then it needs to get pushed out into the exhaust. So that's the basic idea. So what you're doing on how you can make power and how you can change things, you can change when exactly does the spark happen. Okay. <clears throat> by making it sooner, you can influence things. By making it later, you can influence things. Generally speaking, by making the, so the, the, the measurement starting point is what they call top dead center. So when this, in my case, when this A part, see this A letter, when it's right at the top, I wish I could pause this GIF, <laughs> but it's, when it's right at the top, that's like zero. And then slightly moving, you have a plus or minus, right? Now, by the two terminologies to refer to it is either making the spark plug happen before top dead center, that's referred to as advanced timing. To change the spark plug timing after top dead center, that's referred to as retard timing. So you're going plus or minus. Mm -hmm. They have different things. Uh, generally speaking, advancing the timing can change the horsepower and torque levels, and so does retard the timing. Um, but they have different functions and suit different needs. Um, but there's there's changes that can happen there. Secondarily, you can actually change how much fuel goes into it, <clears throat> and this all happens like you know in the millisecond range, so like computer fast, like it's throwing in fuel uh, by changing. Yeah, the right fuel goes in, you're going to influence how good that uh, combustion is. So, like, but, I mean, if you wanted, you could fuck up your whole engine then if you just oh, yeah. mess with all those inputs. Yep, exactly. So how do you, like, how do you know what the right thing is? Well, I mentioned before, we have a golden measurement called stoic, which is 14.7 to 1, right? Yeah. So, that's our goal. So how would you get there? Well, number one, you need a measurement tool. So how would you measure molecules? And there's there's sensors and stuff to go into these things to measure the molecules of the intake and the exhaust. So they have one of them is called like a wideband sensor. This is a, a tool that you would place in your exhaust to measure the ratio, the air to fuel. So it gives you like a number. Mm -hmm. So in that combustion, so after the combustion happens, 
it'll say like, oh, there's this many air, to, this is the ratio of air to fuel, and this is an oxygen center. So it's basically just measuring how much oxygen per um, cubic, cubic meter of a uh, space it's measuring. <laughs> So that's like one important tool. Gotcha. Another important tool, even before, back in the day, you know, we didn't have these, like in the 80s even, they weren't even around. You would have to measure the temperature of the exhaust. So they would call that an exhaust EGT, exhaust temperature gauge. <clears throat> so it just measures temperature. Now, when you change the timing and the fuel mapping, basically if your car is running rich, meaning there's more fuel that's needed, to be there for the combustion cycle, it'll run cooler. So the exhaust, the combustion cycle will be cooler, mostly because there's more like fluid. But if it runs opposite of that, which we refer to as lean, meaning there's not enough fuel to get that 14% ratio, the exhaust gets really hot. So you could use that as a measurement tool too. You can see mm. and there's a little bit of delay, right? Because uh, the temperature doesn't happen instantly. It's a, there's a little bit of delay. So it's a, it's a different type of measurement tool, but ultimately you should have all these like sensors to see what your ratio is and make adjustments accordingly. Now, <clears throat> if you look at what it might look like in real time, this is what something it might look like. I'll do this quickly, I'll look at a 3D graph. But we have a 3D graph and you can like change each little single block to add fuel or take away fuel at a specific instance of time. Wow. You can see here we have engine speed, so like RPM. Then you go like, like they have manifold pressure. So how much pressure is inside the intake? And they have a bunch that they get four, it's kind of a five dimensional graph, but you can change every influencing factor. Like on this one, they have RPM, they're changing it every about 250 RPM. And you would manually go by block to block and like make sure it's all good. Gee, so in a race car, this is pretty pivotal? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and everything changes based upon your atmosphere, right? So wherever you go, it's all different. This has to be changed. A little bit, yeah. Jeez. So I would imagine someone like Ferrari, say, their data of this sheet, say, they've been saved for years and years and years and years for different models. It's got to be worth shit tons of money, right? Yeah. They don't, they don't allow that to be publicly known. That's all their internal thing, for sure. Yeah, right, right. This is like crazy, crazy data. And so they're influencing that on a per RPM basis, essentially, right? Yeah. And that this is just like a, this is a very entry level uh, data analysis. There's so many more things involved. For example, anything that's moving fast, like the inside of an engine, uh, one of the things that becomes interesting is a thing called like, like sonic wave, like vibrations. How does air move throughout a cylinder or any through a sort of vacuum? Like you have a pipe, how does air move through the pipe smoothly and fluidly? Or does it mm -hmm. not move smoothly and fluidly? Well, that's a whole other concept too. Um, like Ferrari is actually probably the best in the world at it, of making sure their cars sound supreme. Mm. By doing exhaust, extensive exhaust, like vibration analysis, to make sure they, they work the way they do and sound the way they do. Wow. Um, I'm just going like, to push this. So like the, the style of the exhaust itself, not even has to do with inside the engine, but how it comes out of the engine is a huge influence factor. How it comes out? Yeah. Or, yeah, it's uh, not just the exhaust, but how it goes into the motor too. Uh, so in this case, you might be able to see, but there's like a bunch of red, this is all, it's all hot because it's like running. But here's like one, two, there's four pipes here. And how, notice that they all kind of, we would refer this as equal length. So each of these pipes, like this one is the furthest away, so it goes straight. But this one, it kind of does like this weird little bend and then goes in. What that equates to is that this, this pipe with a little mm -hmm. bend, the same overall length as this pipe. Which, but it's because it's farther away, they'd accommodate that by making a little bend. Because what they're trying to do is have them all equal length so that the sonic vibrations go into the exhaust at the same time. Another example. Of the right, wow. You yeah, know, this one's like the furthest away, and that guy, it's just a smooth one, but this one is like closer, so it has to like do this like weird bend. 
Uh, see, I always wondered why they were shaped like that. I mean, wow, okay, that answers that question. I never knew why they were shaped like that, and there are all these twisty bends and turns, and wow, okay, that's cool. What are those called again? <clears throat> well, these are just called exhaust manifolds. Okay. Wow, that's cool to know. See, I didn't know. So that's... So here's like a, the counter example. Like this one does not have equal length exhaust. It's just like straight. Yep. This one has it would have a very different sound and ultimately not as not be as optimal comparatively to the other ones I just showed you. Because what happens here in this so case, with that exhaust. Yeah. So what would happen in this case is that one vibration will come in, another one will come in, might be at the same time, and then it'll collide. And that would cause a disturbance, which would ultimately allow mm -hmm. not the exhaust to flow efficiently. Whereas in oh, this okay. case, because there's like bends and tubes and stuff like this one, it's made such that when when this piston fires and the exhaust comes through, uh, they do not collide with this ones. So each one is allowed to, to run independently, it's all smooth. They're arriving together. Wow. Yeah. And then there's the opposite of that, which is the intake, so how air comes in. So the same idea, uh, but just allowing air to come in smoothly. So question with, with racing, with exhausting every after every single race? What was that? What was the question? Like with, the, with exhaust manifolds in racing, are they taking that entire car it down and cleaning it all and then putting it back together? before every race? Oh yeah, every time. Typically on like um, big race cars. Does, does, does build, build up of, of exhaust? Sorry, you're breaking up. <laughs> what? You're breaking up, sorry. Is it good now? Hmm. So I was asking like with the exhaust manifolds, does build up happen within that? And like with racing, do they have to take that apart, clean it, and put it back together before every race? Do they do that or no? It varies by the racing style. Um, like drag racing is a good example. So drag racing is like the probably the most extreme version. In drag racing, those motors and those motors are actually destroyed after one pass on the highest level. So those what the hell? Those top fuel dragsters that like are very long have like very skinny tires and like huge ones like very long things like uh, these things. Yep. These things, whatever. Uh, those things make yep. uh, like 10,000 to like 30,000 horsepower. Wow. And at that power level, they are destroyed after a single pass. Jesus. So it's they, almost like a rocket. Yeah, totally is. So what they do is after one pass, they get it back to the pits and tear down the motor and put it back together every time. Jesus. 